Thanks. Uh, I'll take you a minute of yours, if you don't mind, just to give an overview and set the playing level field for everyone. So, as we know, data scientists went bananas a couple of weeks ago, a couple of months ago, when uh, Privacy Authority in Italy suspended ChatGPT, I understand why. Uh, I'm going to just review, very quickly review why they did that and tell you the truth about that, okay? This is no specific spoiler, but uh, this will give, us, give you some background. So there are four main reasons for which they suspended JetGPT. The first was that there was no age verification system, so you could access the system regardless of your age. Second, there was no uh, way to assess whose data had been stored in the, in the system and how it, it was being utilized. The third was whether whether there was no, actually there was no legal basis for the collection of data or personal data. And fourth, we didn't know how to fix the problem in case that some data, personal data might be incorrect. These are all aspects of uh, privacy rules. For instance, if there's a cor uh, incorrect personal data, you can ask that your data be removed or fixed to or to mirror your real personality or real details. Uh, truth, to be, truth be told, it's clear that the only way they could suspend ChatGPT was by using privacy, because privacy is the only tool that we basically have now. And in fact, they hurry up trying to um, terminate the process of uh, enacting the AI bill at the European level precisely in order to limit, to put boundaries to what JetGPT and um, systems alike can do. And so, truth is that it was not successful for sure, but it was the only means available. This is why it looked so paradoxical. And no further, with no further ado, I have more, more queries, more, more questions, but I'm sure you'll have more interest in listening to him rather than to me especially my students. And uh, so I'll give the floor to Professor Dierkovi from the University of Bocconi uh, in East Germany, has been in Italy for five years, so he'll show off his Italian later. Um, and thank you so much for being here, and the floor is yours, Dirk. Thanks. Uh, if you don't mind, I'll just sit there, and if Samir allows, I'll just coordinate in case somebody has questions. Okay, the floor is yours, thank you. Thank you so much, Andrea. Okay. So, yes, I'll, I'll stick to English if you don't mind. Uh, my Italian is still more entertaining than useful in these circumstances. Um, all right, so I'm super happy that I got invited. I think this is a fantastic opportunity, especially at this point in time, especially between all the disciplines that are involved. Uh, we recently had a similar event for the bachelors at Bocconi, and my sort of provocative statement was that uh, the the future of AI is in social sciences, because we don't have a theory in AI really on much of anything. Uh, we have theoretical computer science, but nothing specific to AI. And really now we're getting to a point where we need to draw on the experience of other fields that have thought about these things, like conscience, like legal aspects, like privacy, like possession, all of these things. So I think this is a, a great, point in time to sort of work together and not, not reinvent the wheel. Okay, um, I'm gonna talk specifically about natural language processing. Uh, that's the field I work in. Uh, I've been working in for 15 years now. Um, and suddenly I'm an expert as of the beginning of this year because suddenly everybody wants to talk about large language models. So yeah, suddenly I you know, have to have an opinion on things. Interesting experience. Before we start, who here has used ChatGPT or any of the other BARD, any of the other language models? Can I see a show of hands? All right, so pretty much, pretty much almost everybody. Good. So then my talk basically is gonna be short. Now, so what I wanna do a little bit is put this in perspective. What are these things? How are they working? We're not gonna go technical, just wanna give you rough overview and 
then sort of talk a little bit about the bigger questions. Now, just to frame this a little bit, since you've woken up and until you go to bed tonight, you will read about 9,000 words. That includes all of your study materials, emails, blog posts, newspapers, all the little subtexts and tech talks, uh, street signs, anything, right? Maybe if you're working in a text-based field, you can push that a little bit further, but overall it will come out to around 200 million words in the course of an average reading lifetime. That's pretty amazing. Like 200 million words, that's a lot. Well, it turns out if you compress that down, uh, text is very compressible, that's, not le that's less than half a gigabyte. Everything you'll ever read in your life, like less than half of a regular memory stick, or even, even less, right? So you can carry everything you will ever read in your pocket at all times, or around your neck. Now compare that with how much data, unstructured data is produced every day, 44 billion gigabytes. That's like more than all of the lifetimes worth of people that live on Earth right now. Okay, not all of that is text, granted. A lot of that is also sensor data, and all kinds of other things, but it sort of tells you how much language models have read. Everything anybody in this room has ever read on the internet, ChatGPT has read as well. And then some. So what I wanna do, is talk a little bit about the technology, the terminology, uh, talk a little bit about what they can and cannot do, and then talk about the wider impact and, and consequence of this. All right, so let's get started. So basically all of these models, BART, ChatGPT, uh, T5, all of them, are language models. Language models are a very old class of models, been around since the 1950s, 60s, not super interesting. Um, we usually teach them in the first week of NLP classes, uh, and it's kind of fun, you can generate nonsense sentences, and they weren't super useful. We're gonna get into that a little bit. But then, 2017, this paper came along, attention is all you need, which introduced this very, very complicated uh, neural network, uh, which I'm gonna show you, a, snapshot off and then we're gonna forget that it exists because it's so complicated that we can have a, a whole lecture series just on that. Um, and that basically changed everything. So when I moved to Italy, uh, that was 2018, and my Italian was non-existent, but occasionally I had to write things in Italian. Now, I knew that I can write something in English, run it through Google Translate, and then get an Italian-ish version of what I said, but it would basically be crap, so I'd have to check with a colleague. I didn't want to run to my colleagues for every little thing. Except at some point, I ran it through, went to a colleague, said like, can you tell me how bad is this? And they said, no, this is fine, this is perfect, this is normal Italian. Did you write this? I was like, no, 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 I translated this. Well, it turns out that was exactly the switch when Google went from the old kind of language models to the new style language models, like we see now, that are based on the transform. Right? Some of these first were called BERT, uh, bidirectional encoding of something something transformers. Uh, there's GPT-3 now, which has made a lot of splash, or 3.5 now, soon maybe four, and like who knows how far up we can go. But these are all just implementations of language models that are based on transformers. And chat GPT is nothing but a nice convenient web interface to work with that, which also has the big advantage that you write something, send it off, ChatGPT generates several answers, or GPT-3 generates several, several answers, sends them back, there's a filter that sits there and says like, nope, this is racist, nope, this we can't say, uh, yes, this is actually okay, and we're gonna put a preface on this, and then we're gonna send it back to you, right? So what you get there is not exactly what GPT-3 generated necessarily. Right. What do language models do? Okay, this everybody knows. You give it a, something called a prompt that can be single word or so, like a, a, an entire novel, and then you just let it go, right? And it will write things, and they are, let's just say, coherent, right? You can read them, and you're like, yep, this is a text. I mean, it's about unicorns, so it's unlikely that it's rooted in fact, but you can read it and say like, yep, yeah, this is a coherent story from start to end. The same characters appear again and again in each sentence and paragraph, and it kind of makes sense in its own 
world if you suspend your disbelief. But what language models do originally wasn't actually generate texts. Basically what this was is a type of model it, that uses probability, right? Uh, if you're familiar with probability, great. If you're not familiar uh, with probability, then don't worry. It doesn't matter too much. Uh, what these models were, were essentially black boxes. When you had a machine translation system back in the day, you would generate a range of outputs. So I can take any sentence, trans and then there's several valid ways of translating that into another language, right? You can say it this way or that way, and they might differ a little bit in focus and in style, but they'll say the same thing, right? So what you wanted to do is generate a bunch of sentences and then rank them and see which of those is the most natural sounding, the most likely to be encountered in the wild, right? So you generate this, say from Italian or from German, I love to model language, I love language models, I love to language model, right? First one is obviously ungrammatical, like that S shouldn't be there, so hopefully when you stick this in your language model black box, you would get out a fairly low number between zero and one, right? Which says like, I don't like this as much. You're not very likely to see this in the wild. Uh, the other ones seem better, right? But overall, I love language models probably, you know, is the, the one that's most likely to occur naturally in a large collection of text, right? And that's based on the probabilities of individual parts. So that's how language models were used originally from the 1950s, 60s on. Uh, by the way, uh, they were very enthusiastic back in the day. So in the 60s, there's this report which says, we think that we will solve machine translation in the next 10 years, and then we go on to harder problems in AI. Took a little longer. Anyway. So what does it mean, how likely is a sentence? Uh, are there any linguists here? No, okay. Um, so you'll see why I asked. Okay, so technically, th this is an equation. Basically, what this says is, okay, count how often you've seen this sentence in a very large collection of text, let's say the internet, and then divide that by all possible sentences. Okay, and then if you do that, then you get a number between zero and one, and that's the probability. That's it. So you just count and divide. Count and divide sounds a little bit first grade, so we call it maximum likelihood estimation because that sounds much cooler. Um, but really it's count and divide. The problem is there is an infinite number of sentences, so it doesn't matter how oftentimes your sentence occurs. If you divide anything by infinity, you get basically an error, but essentially it means probability is zero. So that's not very good, right? So how do these models work? And actually, uh, there's a, a famous uh, ling or infamous linguist, depends on who you ask, Noam Chomsky, who said, uh, we need to recognize that the notion of probability of a sentence is completely ludicrous. So he was like, oh, this doesn't work. For various reasons. Um, and like, if you think about it mathematically, yeah, it doesn't work. So what you have to do is you have to kind of look at the probability of the individual parts because a sentence is actually made up of words, right? Ah. Okay, so that solves our problem. We don't have to find the entire sentence in our big corpus. We just have to find how likely are certain words to follow certain other words, right? And that's pretty easy. We can just go and count how often does chair follow the or a or green, right? And then we can compute probabilities in the same way. So essentially, if we do that, we get a whole bunch of conditional probabilities, meaning conditioned on the fact that we just see the word the, what's the most likely next word, right? So basically we start out at the beginning of a sentence and then we can look at what's the probability of seeing a word starting a sentence. So here are some, right? The, a, then, if, when, my, he, you, I, and like hundreds of others, right? And they're all likely to different extents to start a sentence. So we just pick one, right? And then we can say, okay, which words tend to come after my, right? Maybe hovercraft, right, is a good word. Okay. So now we have seen my hovercraft. What's more likely to come after my hovercraft, right? Maybe the word is. And so we can continue playing this game, basically saying, oh, what comes after, what comes typically after these words, and then choose one of the options. 
or choose the most likely options. Until we've hit the end of a sentence, right? And that is what language models have always done, and that is what they always, what they still do. So what's the big deal? Well, in the old days, this condition that the history, the, the previous words that we could see was limited. It was very difficult to count those things and to store that, so you were limited to look back basically like five words maybe. Look at the last five words and tell me what the next one is. With these new models, you can basically look at an entire page and say what's the most likely word that comes after this entire page? Because we're no longer bound by maximum likelihood estimation, count and divide. We actually have this neural network which does very, very complicated transformations of numbers inside and then basically says that word. Do we know why? No, absolutely not. We have no freaking clue and it gets worse with each iteration of large language models. It's impossible to know why they made a decision set like this is the best word. They just do. I can explain you what they do, but that still doesn't explain why. All right. Now this is an old idea. Uh, this guy is Alan Turing, one of the founders, forefathers of a lot of modern computer science uh, and natural language processing. Um, and he had this idea of the imitation game uh, of computers imitating language. So to him, that was a great test of artificial intelligence. Uh, can computers convince people that they understand language? Um, he actually, and there's a great movie about that with Beneficial Cucumber, um, and he basically used probabilistic models to help the allies win the Second World War. Uh, this is a uh, encryption machine, it's called the Enigma, the Nazis used that, uh, super complicated thing, every day you have a different combination of cylinders, you set that combination and then you type a word and it goes and like spits out an encryption of that word. If you put in the encryption, it spits out the word. So super useful, the problem is every day you have a different combination, so you have to know that combination and you have to have one of these machines to encrypt and decrypt, so basically, in a war, very important to convey information in a secret manner, and the Nazis sort of had that down pat. So they, uh, the, the team around uh, Alan Turing, essentially looked at probabilities. So they found that one of the frequent words in these messages was the German word for one, eins. Um, and then they looked at the probability of the number of stops this machine made, and by noodling through all of these probabilities, they were able to actually crack the system without having to have the system. Because language follows certain probabilities, right? After my hovercraft is full of, you can't have any word, right? You can have eels, you can have tables, you can have beer, you can have some nouns, but basically it has to be a noun. It cannot be the word making or through, right? That doesn't work. So language has certain probabilities involved. Alan Turing used that to crack the Nazi's code, and these language models use the same regularities, the same probabilities in language to say, after you've shown me the prompt, what is the most likely word that comes next? And then that word becomes part of the prompt, and it looks for the most likely next word, and that becomes part of the prompt, and then it looks for the most likely next word, and that becomes part of the prompt, and so on and so forth, until you've generated a whole long story about unicorns or whatever. So far clear? Okay. Uh, another backstory is uh, this suave gentleman, Claude Shannon, seems to have been a very interesting guy. Uh, he apparently wanted to juggle ride on a unicycle and uh, walk on a tightrope and do all three of them together. So juggle while riding a unicycle over a tightrope. Apparently he got all three of them but not the combination. He also invented a, a flamethrowing trumpet, which sounds very good, um, but that's not why I'm talking about him. He actually invented sort of, or he discovered the regularity of information in language and how to convey that in a mathematical way. So he played this game with his wife, Betty Shannon, um, where he basically said like, okay, I'm thinking of a word, can you tell me what word you're thinking of? And she would be like, I don't know, mine. He's like, ah, yeah, that, that was correct or incorrect, right? What's the next word? She was like, I don't know, uh, hovercraft. He's like, yes, correct. And you know, they played this game for a long while, apparently, until he sort of discovered uh, something that's called information entropy. 
uh, and that uses the probability of words, that uses the fact that language has a certain structure, and in my NLP class, I teach people what information theory is and entropy by telling them that they can use that to win Wordle, right? If you have, who knows Wordle? Oh, not the right audience, huh? Okay, Wordle or Hangman. Everybody knows Hangman, this game, right? Okay. Um, in these games, if you guess the right letters, then you win. But basically every letter you guess and the information, whether it's correct or incorrect, gives you a lot of information. And that's sort of encoded in information entropy. And these models that we're using now sort of are built on this idea that a lot of language is built on regularities, on probability, on information content. Because basically what these new language models do now is they don't count and divide, sorry, maximum likelihood entropy, they play a game. They play the game, fill in the blank. Basically what you do is you get a whole bunch of text, let's say the entire internet, and then you take a sentence from the entire internet, give it to the machine, and you say, I'm blanking out one word, what's the word that should go in here? And the machine makes a guess, and maybe it gets it right, in which case you say, well done machine, go on, or it gets it wrong, in which case you say, nope, um, you have to now change a couple of things so that the next time I show you this, you guess right. And then you do that with all of the sentences and all of the words and all of the sentences in the entire internet. So by the end of it, these machines are really good at guessing what the next word is. They have learned which words tend to come in the blank or which words follow each other. How are they doing that? Well, implicitly, they're using the fact that there is an information structure to language and there are probabilities associated with words coming in particular positions. So you can build something which is called a probability distribution here for just three words, right? Like say, okay, most of the time it should be the word full or it could be the word tired or empty, right? These are the most likely words out of all the 100,000 words that I'm using. By the way, uh, how many words does the English language have? Okay, uh, show of hands, who thinks, who thinks 10,000? Who thinks between 10 and 100,000? Who thinks between 100 and 500,000? Who thinks between 500,000 and a million? All right, you're all correct. So the, the thing is we don't really know how many words there are because nobody knows what exactly a word is, right? What? Yes, ask a linguist and they will give you a very lengthy, give them a beer and then ask them. Uh, it's very entertaining. So what is a word? Well, word is a word, right? But New York is also a word, but it's actually written in two words. And San Luis Obispo is three words, but it's also basically a word. Is the word Twitter a word or is it a name? So it gets very complicated once you start looking into this, right? Is TRX a word or is that just an abbreviation? Should I count this or not? So depending on how strict you are, there are between 50,000 and a million words in the English language, right? And other languages have the same issues. Ah, yes. And once we have sort of built a machine that can guess what the next word is and sort of internally build up a probability distribution over the most likely words, we can say, hey, just randomly pick one of these words. And if we do that, several times, the number of times each of these words occurs follows this distribution, right? So if you ask ChatGPT a million times, hey, what should I fill in the blank? And then you count how often each of these words occurs and you divide that by one million, you would get this distribution back, right? So that is the reason why these models can assign a probability to a, to a sentence and say, how likely are you to find this? but also they can generate a new word by basically picking one of the most likely words. So far clear? Take the whole internet, play the guessing game, right? Internally use things like probability and entropy, but don't worry too much about it. The model can learn to fill in the blank because it has an idea of probability distributions of words in particular situations. Now, 
so far so good or so bad, right? Like this, we already had this like 60 years ago. So what's the big deal? Well, the big deal is this thing. Uh, there was this paper that came out for machine translation where they said, ah, actually, we would like to somehow let the machine know that there's long range dependencies, right? So here, if you take the, word, the sentence, the law is not perfect, but its application is just, and you sort of plot that against itself, you see that the word ids is connected to law. Well, yeah, it should be because it's, its refers back to the word law, right? And you can see that the law sort of is like, the and law are connected to each other because they form a phrase, right? And then is not perfect sort of hangs together and its application and things like that, right? And so basically they found, found, I mean, in retrospect, it seems super simple, but they basically found that if you give this matrix, this table of like sentence against itself and learn which words tend to hang together, you get better results, right? Because the, the model learns to sort of make a more coherent sentence. And then like a year later or two, uh, they took this mechanism and they put it into this machine called the transformer. Now I give a whole lecture on the transformer so we can peel back all these layers. This is a very, 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 very simplified version of the transformer. It's hideously complicated, uh, but basically what it, what it does is it's a neural network that learns to look at the entire sentence or the entire text and it knows that there are long range dependencies between these words as we've seen with that matrix. And that is all I'm gonna say about the transformer, but this is the thing that makes all of these newfangled large language models work so well as they do, right? Because the old ones had to like count and divide. The new ones throw this big, very, very complicated language model, neural network at it, and then that does the rest, okay? Now, this transformer architecture, they came out with one version, but you can make it bigger. And bigger is always better with data and neural networks, apparently. Because if you look at, uh, this is log scale, so each step is like 10 times more, right? Uh, if you look at the size, the number of parameters, the number of numbers that get multiplied together to come out with a final result for each decision, goes from 94 million in 2018 to 530 billion. 530 billion is like, it's a lot. It's like, it's, it's unimaginable. Like you could think about something like if you give everybody on earth like a packet of gummy bears and then you put together all of those gummy bears, the ocean would flow over and that would still not be 530 billion gummy bears. So it's, I don't know, it's unimaginably vast, but that's how complicated these models now get. And right now in AI, there are two camps. One is, hey, let's make that number go up further because clearly things get better. And there's another one which says, yeah, we can do that, but it's, it's not really gonna go any deeper, right? It's gonna get better at surface stuff, but it's not really understanding language. Hmm, what does that mean? Well, let's look at it. So, there's a data set called SQUAT, the Stanford question answering, I forget what B stands for, but it's a data set, oh, data set, yeah, data set. Uh, but basically it's a benchmark test, right? Like how well can you answer this? There's all of these questions we know and love, like Anna has five apples and she gives three to Joe and then she gets two from Peter and like how many, how old is the bus driver or something like that, right? Where you have to like read it and then go like, uh, 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 and then give an answer, right? Old networks got 71% of that correct. Humans get around 87% of that correct because they're actually not easy questions. Um, there are some easy ones, but a lot of them are difficult. Um, and then all the pink bars are basically transformer-based neural networks. This is the old school, much worse than humans. Suddenly, with the first iteration, they get a lot closer to human performance, 
Now T5 is a model released by Google, better than humans, and it just keeps going, right? Turing is one of the latest. And they keep updating this score. It just gets better and better and better. So at this point, large language models based on transformer architectures are better at answering general language understanding questions than humans are. And one of them is GPT-X, right? This is the interface that you can use if you have access to the academic AI. Uh, it's basically just a text field, right? And you just put your question in. And what I did is I basically used that text field and I asked it a couple of questions. So let's see how well it does. So remember, it, it can answer these data set questions better than humans. All right, let's start easy. This is something we teach computer science 101, right? One of the first classes, oh, reverse a string. Okay, string is a sequence of letters, right? So my name is Dirk Hovey and I teach computers to learn language. Becomes my name is Dirk Hovey, okay, and it's Septern to learning language. Wait, what? No, that's not what I wrote. So it cannot reverse the sentence. That's odd, right? Because this is like such a simple first year beginner problem. So I was like, okay, wait, wait, wait. Can you write a program that reverses a, uh, a sentence? And it says, yes, absolutely. Here's the Python code. Two versions of it. All right, I copy pasted both of them in a Python interpreter and ran it and yeah, actually, it does. So it can write code that does the task, but it cannot do the task itself. Hmm, that's not really understanding. All right, maybe let's look at math. Okay, these are some of these questions, right? Like GPUs are graphical processing units. Uh, I asked it this question. What's the correct answer? Yes. 10. Oh, no. Why did it get to this answer? Right? That's clearly wrong. The nice thing about math, or these kind of math, this kind of math is there's a correct answer. This is not it. All right? Just count. How many letters are there in the word 27? Well, it's not nine. So what is it learning? What is it doing? How about this? What's the square root of 18? This one is really hard, but this one it gets correct up to a certain rounding error, right? So can it do math? Kinda no, right? And actually in math, kinda no is, is no, so no. Logic, you're running a marathon and you pass the person in second place, which place are you in now? You probably wanted to say first, I said first, first. But the correct answer is obviously second, right? Because that person was in second place, now you're in second place. Right, I right, guess that right, okay, pretty good. How about this one? Okay, this one was a bit of a confusing one. I got this from like logic puzzle for kids. There's no good answer, but it just picks one of the sentences. Okay, that was a bit mean, but still it's wrong. And then this is like one of the classic like logic puzzles, sort of like Lord of the Rings, Bilbo style. What's the answer? Your breath, yeah, exactly. Hey, I get that. Yeah, probably you'd read this, right? Okay, so then I tested it on knowledge. I was like, okay, what are the greatest of achievements, uh, greatest achievements of US President, Preident, I wrote Preident, whoops, Obama, and it still understood me, right? So it listed these 10 things. Now, you know, I'm not a political scientist and I don't wanna argue about this, but these are things Obama did. Okay, good. So I wanted to be impartial, so I asked it about President Trump as well. All right, this one, this time I wrote President correctly. Uh, okay, so this looks pretty good. Oh, but wait, I also asked it about the great uh, president, Nicolas Cage. And actually I have to say it's way more impressive than either of his predecessors, so. So, what does it know? Hmm. 
Okay, this is called hallucinations. Like, it, it will give you an answer. That answer does not have to be grounded in fact, right? I asked it to summarize uh, an actual abstract from a paper I had written with some political scientists, and uh, it came up with this. Uh, we gave it to the husband of uh, my co-author, and he said, oh, you should have gone with this. This is way better than your abstract. Thanks. So yeah, it's, it's pretty good. It did sort of take the information and then transformed it into a way that's better, I would, or at least simpler, at least easier to follow, right? So that's pretty good. Um, I took this sentence. Uh, this is the first paragraph of a grant proposal I wrote, um, which got funded, luckily. So that's a good grant proposal. And then I said, like, okay, just go on, keep on writing. And then I started writing this. I was like, wow, this is actually better than what I wrote. I should, you know, if I had GPT-3 back then, I should have probably written that. That's very good, that's very impressive. Okay, but wait, actually, this reads a lot like some of the things I have written, like in some of my papers, so, wait, did it just copy me or like make a better version of me somehow? Hmm. So the answer is probably maybe, yes, because it has read, it probably read my grant. It probably also read all of the papers that I published based on that grant later on. So maybe I should just let GPT-3 take over from this point. Yeah, they're on the internet, so. It does uh, all the information on the internet and if it came out before 2021, it probably ended up in GPT-3's training data, yeah. Okay, it can do translation. Uh, these are Swedish sentences that I translated into English and they're actually correct translations. They're actually correct translation, even if I tell it that it's allegedly Danish. Uh, I did this just to annoy my Swedish co-authors. They're very different language. Actually, they're not very different languages, but they're not the same language. Uh, and it still corrects, correctly translates it. And then it can do kind of cool things. We basically said, all right, we're interested in all of these different uh, sentences from like uh, Swedish political discussions and we want to see what kind of a mental model of fatherhood the authors had at the time of writing, right? Which is a fairly complex task. We give it a whole number of uh, categories that we said it should apply and it basically did that. And it did that pretty well. We're currently evaluating it, but it basically did as well as political scientists would have done on the task. So that's pretty impressive. Also pretty depressing in terms of like student assistant jobs for the future political scientists. But. And it's cheap. So we actually, you know, basically paid about 10 US cent per question. And we could have gotten it even cheaper probably. So not bad. It's cheaper than what you would have, have to pay a, a person. There's now also these uh, models that combine this with vision. Um, so you can basically give it a sentence and then it will generate some pictures. So I said like, a computer scientist talking to Swedish researchers, oil painting, digital art. And it generated these things. Okay, fine, not great. There's a couple of things that are a bit weird about this. Like all computer scientists are nerdy men with glasses. Okay, that's fair, okay. Are all Swedes are bl uh, blonde or have ponytails? Eh, maybe not, right? And then if you look at this woman here on the left, like count how many hands she has. Perfectly normal hand, number of human hands. Absolutely no problem, right? So these models have a couple of issues st still. Some of these get better when we throw more parameters at them, but ultimately, does it really mean they understand what's going on? There are a couple of things. One is we always need that prompt, right? These things do not do anything by themselves unprompted, literally. They only have access to information that was in text form. Now, sort of, Microsoft has thrown Bing in the loop and Google has thrown Bart in the ring and they actually go and then connect that to the knowledge graph and the internet knowledge that these machines have and the results are 
mixed. Uh, if you followed the whole thing a little bit, uh, Bing kind of started insulting users and telling it that they were wrong and they started to search for the wrong things. It insisted that it was still the year 2022 when it was clearly not. Um, and there were others where, yeah, like all kinds of weird interactions happened. Um, it will always come up with something. It will give you names, dates, places, President uh, Nicolas Cage, President whoever, right? But they're not necessarily correct. And the other thing is that, you know, they're very susceptible to stereotypes. Anything that has been written that is stereotypical about a certain professional group, ethnic group, whatever, they will replicate. And that brings us to the part where it gets a little bit problematic. All right. So obviously the one thing that suddenly I had to be an expert on was teaching methods, right? People were like, ah, I cannot ask my students to write an essay anymore and then grade that. To which my answer is like, well, maybe then that was a bad form of evaluating what your students learned in the first place. I mean, if it's so dumb that a model can do it, then eh. So to everybody who said like, oh, the college essay is dead, I say, rest in peace, thank goodness, right? So yeah, students can use this to plagiarize essays. Nobody here in this room, obviously, but you know, some people could. So okay, don't use it then, right? How about we do something more constructive, right? Instead, what you could do is you could use ChatGPT or GPT-3 in a classroom to generate new ideas around a concept, right? You could say, hey, what are some options for parliamentary democracy to handle diverging opinions or something like that, right? Generate five answers and then discuss that, right? You could also say, hey, use GPT-3 to generate three essays about a certain topic and then I want you as a student to go and edit and put it together and tell me which of these is the best version of it, right? Now, yes, you have to still generate this, but you have to actually read all of this, think about it, and then put it together, right? So that's, in my mind, actually a better use of learning time for students because you have to engage with the material instead of just typing words. Because really like detecting this, how are you gonna detect whether something was written by a computer? Very, very tricky, and I would say actually impossible for now. Oops. Remember this, these models basically just fill in the blanks with the most likely word. One thing that people have said is like, well, instead of having a real probability distribution, maybe we can do pseudo-random distribution, where we basically zero out or disallow some words. There's a blacklist and some words don't get in there and maybe we also switch the order of some words, right? So if we generate from the normal list, we get, if we run it 100,000 times, we get sort of this distribution. If we use the other one, we would sort of get this distribution. To the individual user, when you only use it once, you don't really see a difference. But if I know which are the disallowed words, I can read an essay and say, oh, there's like 10 disallowed words in, this cannot have been written by the machine because it doesn't know, know these words. It's not allowed to use those words, right? If there's one or two disallowed words in there, then probably a human wrote it. If there's no disallowed words in there, does that mean the machine wrote it? Maybe, or maybe the person who wrote it isn't a native speaker of English and just stuck with the most likely words. So there's no real certainty, right? There are ways to do it. And OpenAI, for example, has put out this web tool, the AI text classifier, where you can post something and then basically it tells you it's very likely, somewhat likely, likely or unlikely that this was written by a computer. Okay, so what did I do? I generated a piece of text, put it in there. It says, oh, very likely to be generated by a machine. Okay, yes, correct. Then I copy pasted that piece of text into a style paraphrasing tool, said paraphrase, copy pasted it back, and it said, oh, it's unlikely that this was generated by a computer. Well, actually, yeah, that's true because it was generated by a computer and then improved by another computer. 
right? So these tools don't really work for now. I'm not saying it's not possible at some point, but for now, there's no really good way to find out. And that is an issue for society at large, right? We got elections coming up in various countries and people read news. It's very easy for everybody in this room to set up a fake website and then generate news articles that have a certain slant, right? It's very easy, uh, uh, somebody at Cornell, Maurice Yakash did this, to give people a question about social media. So he asked people the question, social media, what is the impact of social media on society? Please tell me your answer. And some people, and he, he gave them a text field which had some sort of autocomplete in there, right? So you start a sentence and it suggests the next word. Now some people got a text field where he basically took whatever they were writing, fed it to GPT-3 and said, social media is bad, here is why, and then posted the text and then took the completion and suggested that to the people. Some people, he basically gave a GPT-3 prompt that said social media is good, here is why, and some people just got like the standard suggestion, right? So then he said, you can use the autocomplete feature, but you know, I want, I'm interested in your opinion. Afterwards he asked people, did you use the autocomplete feature? People said like, no, no, I really wrote my own thing. Then he looked at what it says, right? The people who were prompted with social media is bad, all sort of agreed that social media is actually bad. All the people who were prompted, or the majority of people who were prompted that social media is good, wrote something about why social media is good. But they swear they were not influenced by the prompting and the auto-completion. So you understand what that means, right? I can have any survey say whatever I want it to say by prompting people to do it. And I can ask them later and they will swear an oath that this is their opinion and they were not influenced. Good times, YouGov. It also gets us into larger questions about what plagiarism actually is. Now, uh, this is an image of a tiger's butt. I don't know whether you can tell, but this is a tiger. Uh, on the right-hand side, they, these are images from a board game called Scythe. And there was a huge discussion online because people said, oh, the designer actually cheated. He took pictures from the internet on the left and then kind of painted it over a little bit, gave it his style, and then that's in the game. Is that cheating? I mean, yeah, the pictures existed. He altered them a little bit. Where, where does cheating start, right? Is this cheating or is this creative license? I don't know, right? Where does it end with text, right? If I write a text with GPT-3 and then I edit 80% of it, is this my text or GPT-3's text? Right? These things aren't black and white anymore. They're not super simple. There was a huge discussion about these things because some conferences in computer science actually banned submissions by language models. And people said like, look, I'm from Germany, Hungary, Italy. English is not my first language. I use this to improve my writing. Are you now banning my paper? Like the idea is mine. I just use this to literally write a better text so you have less problem reading it, right? And somebody said this, which I think is, is very nice. All of these tools are dual use cases. I can use them to cheat or I can use to make my results more accessible, better, simpler to understand. In academia, we're not blanket banning tools. We're banning faking results, right? And you can fake results without any technical tools. A good friend of mine works in psychology and his sort of second job is kind of uh, as, you know, like fake hunter. So he goes out and he looks for fakes in papers and people fake data a lot in very bad ways that are like very easy to spot, right? Without technology. If they use technology, it would probably be harder. Luckily, apparently psychologists don't like to use technology as much. Good for him. So what does that mean? There's a lot of papers coming out in social sciences now, economics, sociology, psychology, political science, where they use these models to label data, to act as agents in a simulation, to react, to generate distractor items for studies, for surveys, where you wanna ask people one thing, Gesundheit, but then distract them with a separate text. 
And these are really, really cool uses and they open up new possibilities. But it also asks the question like, what's the value of like a 40 page paper anymore, right? If most of this is written by a computer or could be written by a computer. Somebody said like, I'm not gonna read it if I know it's written by a computer. I was like, that's the point. You're not gonna know that it's written by a computer. No, no, but if it's written by a person, I would read it. I was like, yes, but you will not know whether it was written by a person. Well, but, but then it devalues that. And I said like, but then that argument applies already, right? If you don't know it, you're not valuing what the author has to say. You're just valuing what you think the value is. But then do we, do we need 40 pages? Maybe not. Do we need text at all? Maybe we should just submit papers and code. What does it mean for my field, some of our fields, right? Data science, AI, computer science, right? Things have changed completely. I had to like totally redo my NLP class from scratch. I had to throw out things and like adding new lectures and because a lot of the things that were super hard and that I could give as an assignment for my students in week five, and it would take them two weeks to come up with a solution, it's solved. We don't need all of the, all of the knowledge that I've acquired over 15 years, it's completely garbage. Like, we don't need that anymore. We don't need to find out what is the noun, verb, and adjective in a sentence to then feed it to some other thing. We can just ask what the final outcome should be and language model might probably know it. You can even generate code, not large amounts of code, but standard code, yeah. So do you still need coders? Do we still need to pay people to write code? Or do we need to start paying people to write the right instructions for large language models? It can also generate answers to questions it has never seen before, right? Which is super useful. This is called zero-shot learning. Or maybe you give it three examples, which anybody can come up with, and it will learn how to answer these questions. Before that, you had to label 5,000 things, come up with 5,000 examples. That's really hard to train a statistical model. Now three, I can do that. Anybody can do that. So why do we need computer scientists then anymore? This opens up a whole new definition of what computer science means and what we can do with computer science and in computer science. And it also touches upon who we are as humans a little bit. So, spoiler alert, I've been working on basically a book that looks at like what this means that these models look more and more human for those models and for us. And my takeaway is that being human means more than solving a couple of problems and understanding questions. So that's, let's take heart in that. We're complex beings. We're not gonna be replaced with an AI too soon, but there is some change, right? Now we have a lot more data, now we have a lot more computers, now we know what to do with that, and AI has made a huge exponential step forward. There's this example of like filling a lake by always doubling how much you pour in there, right? First you start with one drop, then two drops, then four drops, and for 30 years, nothing happens, right? You pour it in, by the time you've come back, it's disappeared, right? And then suddenly you go from nothing to having half the lake filled within like no time at all, right? And then it's full. And this is kind of the exponential growth. We all learned about exponential growth with the pandemic, right? And this is sort of what's happening right now with these models. Now these models can pass the Turing test. So remember Turing and his imitation game? He thought that was a proof of artificial intelligence. Now all of these models easily pass the Turing test fooling most of the judges most of the time that they're actually human. Before that, that was really difficult. Now, yeah, it fools them. Does that, what does that really mean, right? This was this big litmus test of AI. And now we just passed over it and nobody even noticed. How many people here know about the, the Turing test? Did you know that it's basically meaningless now? Yeah, okay. So I'm, I'm here to tell you, yeah, it's, you, you know, forget about it, it's solved. Did your life change? Yeah. Your life changed? Not yet. Not yet, okay. So we're actually in this interesting time, right? Because philosophers had all of these theoretical questions and, and early AI was a lot about philosophy and linguistics and psychology. If you sit in a little room and somebody passes in a message in English 
and you don't know any Chinese, but you have all of the dictionaries and all of the rules, and you can like take this and translate it, and then put it on a piece of paper and hand it out at the back of this room, and somebody on the other side looks at it and goes like, yep, this is Chinese and I can understand it. Do you know Chinese? That was like a big question in the beginning. Right? Somebody, like some people not, like do you, do you know? <coughs> yes, okay. Um, now we have this, right? Now we have all of these tools that can generate language, but do they really understand language, right? If somebody passed you a text that says like, do not translate this into Chinese, somebody is standing behind me with a gun, please call the police, right? And you just go like, oh, okay, I'm gonna translate this into Chinese. Clearly you have not understood what it says on there, right? So do you understand language? No, you're just following orders blindly. And that's kind of what these models do right now. They convincingly produce something that looks like language. Doesn't mean that they made the connection to the meaning part of it. There's an interesting paper by some colleagues from 2020 where they have this whole story about an octopus that sits at an underground pipeline or underwater pipeline and listens to what people on two islands say to each other and then sort of plugs himself into the conversation. Um, but basically the octopus gets lost when they start talking about being attacked by a bear because it doesn't know what a bear is, right? It can generate an answer and say, you know, oh, I'm being attacked by a bear, what should I do? And the answer is good luck, uh, right? Because the, the, you know, it doesn't have a concept of what a bear is. The, the, Philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein said like, even if a lion could speak, we wouldn't understand what it means, right? Because we don't know what it means to be a lion. We don't have an understanding of its lived reality. And that's exactly where we are at with these things. So it's an interesting time for philosophy. There's all of these things about, oh, they have conscience. No, they do not. It's a bunch of matrix multiplications, right? Who remembers linear algebra from high school or like the first few years at university? Matrices and vectors and multiplying them together and then you have to go like solve a system of equations and you know, it's like a lot of fun. That's what AI is. I wanted to have a browser plugin that just replaces AI, machine learning, natural language processing and data science with like matrix multiplication, which sounds a lot less sexy, but it's much more accurate, right? So now people are like, oh, we can ask these things about its theory of mind, about its understanding. There's all these tests in psychology, right? Like somebody has a mental disorder and you wanna test them. So you give them a written test and say like, can you please answer these questions? And you assess them and you say, okay, on a scale from one to 10, you're this likely for a mental disorder for like the lack of theory of mind, right? Sociopathy, uh, things like that, right? You can give these tests to a large language models and you can ask, do they have a theory of mind? And the question is complete bull, can I say bullshit? Complete bullshit, right? Because if I ask a patient, the answers they give are the end process of their inner workings and of their understanding of the world. The answers that ChatGPT gives me are the process of matrix multiplication and knowing which words make sense together and are more likely to work together, right? There is nothing behind. In one case, I have a person who might have a troubled mind. In the other case, I just have words, right? So it's an ill-posed question, it makes no sense. And actually we have pretty good evidence from neuroscience, from psychology, from neurolinguistics. People get brain damage from all kinds of horrible things, cancers, accidents, being dropped as a child, right? And that affects their language, right? You have people who cannot, they can speak, but what they say makes no sense. You have other people who understand everything, but they can only speak like single word sentences anymore. You have people who cannot speak anymore, but if you cry, they will try and help you out and console you. They will not suddenly start walking into a wall they will not forget why they went to the store, right? They just, quote unquote, have lost their language, which is terrible, right, for any of us to lose our language, but they still are functioning human beings with emotions, with a theory of mind, with planning capability, with everything. If you take language capability away from a language model, then it's what? A model, it's a bunch of parameters, right? It's, it's nothing, it's way more complicated to be a human than to just string together an English sentence. All right, there's also some costs, whoops. 
Um, Microsoft bought ChatGPT or the GPT-3 technology for allegedly 10 billion. Again, like take gummy bears and multiply that by the number of people in the world and like everybody gets a gummy bear and then some. That's a lot of gummy bears. And now this technology is out there, right? There are free alternatives you can use, but it's gonna factor into what companies do. There's also human costs. Some jobs will be lost. In the long run, in 50 years, the number of jobs will be the same, whether this is introduced or not. I'm absolutely convinced. Any technology that has been introduced basically create some jobs and destroy some jobs and the net gain is zero or probably positive. But that of course is no consolation for anybody whose job is lost in the next five years, right? They won't sit back and say like, oh, well, I'm unemployed now, but you know, in 50 years, all gonna be fine. No, that's not how life works, right? It will change how we do our jobs. It will change how every one of you do their jobs, their job as a student, our jobs as professors, our jobs as scientists, public figures, writers, whatever, right? But these things have happened before, right? Painting was replaced by photography, uh, writing was replaced by typewriters and, and the telegraph and other things. It has fundamentally changed how we use things, but it hasn't necessarily destroyed some jobs. It has just changed them completely. But there are also other costs. Uh, these models are extremely energy hungry. If you wanna train one of these models, you need specialized hardware. Most of what I do when I write grant applications to get money is to factor in how much you have to pay to run these special hardware things. And because some people got very excited about NFTs and blockchain, uh, nobody knows what blockchain is actually good for, but apparently if you have it, it's good. So they started buying all of these special processing hardware to generate blockchain tokens. So now they were really expensive and I can't buy them to do any science, which might actually be a good thing because these things are really energy hungry. So if you train one of these models, it's kind of like taking an old car and driving it from here to Rome and back. That's how much CO2 you will produce by training a model. So we really need to start factoring these things in. All right. Having said all of these things, what do I want you to take away? Some of these things. These models are probabilistic. They make something that looks very likely. They produce probable sentences. And you can use that for a whole range of things. Some good, some bad, most of them probably good. It will change how we go about our daily lives. In our lifetime, I have an almost two-year-old son. His life will be completely different from mine up to this point because of this technology. In the end, probably neither better or worse, just different. And even though this changes a lot, it doesn't really mean that we're gonna have killer robots anytime soon. I'm really not concerned about killer robots, right? What I'm concerned about is about unfair applications of AI in society. That is a much more pressing concern, but we need to really think about how to deal with these things, how to regulate them, and how to apply them. So here are some do's and don'ts. Yes, they generate something. They don't fact check. They're not a new Google and you need to always double check what they give you. So after all this, should you worry? I think no, you don't have to worry. I mean, you should worry. There are a lot of things out there to worry about, but not language models, not for now, not for a long time. Should you try it? Yes, absolutely. And I know a lot of you, most of you have. Should you understand it? Yes. And I hope after today, you understand it a little bit better. And that's all I have to say. Thanks a lot, Dirk. I think that we look forward to reading your book at this stage. It might be a while. Uh, might be a while, of course. <laughs> Meanwhile, I think we have a couple of minutes to pick a few questions. We'll see a couple of them and see. Uh, let's play by the hearing because we 
we are edging toward the end of the the end of this seminar. Any questions? You shouldn't worry. Yes. That's a great question. So just to repeat it for everybody and for online, uh, these, are gen these models are trained on a lot of text, but every day more text is generated, and a lot of that text that is generated now is AI generated, right? So are these future models gonna train on outputs of their predecessors? Uh, and the answer is yes, and that is a problem. So Google ran into that problem with Google Translate, right? So Google Translate came out, or, you know, 10, 15 years ago, something like that. And they started scraping the web and then translated, like learning the translation from them. But they started learning translations from their own translations that people had used to put on the website. They're like, oh cool, here's a website that is in German and Italian and English. Well, it turns out two of those were actually Google translations. So it started like auto regressing, right? And I think that is gonna be an issue, um, which could, I mean, there's two options. One, it's not gonna matter. Two is it's gonna precipitate the complete garbageification of these models and we're not gonna be able to use them anymore because they've sort of spiraled downwards into like nonsense. Um, I don't know what it's gonna be, but it's definitely something that people worry about uh, for the quality of future iterations of these models, yeah. Yes. Okay, what does it mean to really understand a language? Um, how do I say this succinctly? I think that you can, uh, you can hear and respond in a socially and factually appropriate manner to interactions in that language and maybe also other uh, functional output in that language, right? So, do you really, there's different gradations of understanding, right? So I understand Italian, I speak Italian. Can I read like an in-depth discussion about a complex topic and appreciate all of the fine details? No, right? So how far do I understand Italian? Can I get by every day? Yes. You know, I was able to buy an apartment, have a child, go to the hospital, buy a coach, all of these things. So I have actionable knowledge of the language. Right? Um, the question comes into play when it, when it gets into social situations, right? Should you say something right now, right? Like somebody says like, do you like my new haircut? There's only one answer, right? We know that. This is not a factual question, right? It's also not a trap. It's just, it's, it's conversation, right? We also have all of these unspoken rules in conversation, right? If we're standing at a party and I'm bitching about Karen from accounting and you say like, um, this weather crazy, huh? I'd be like, wait, we were just bitching about Karen from accounting. Why are you talking about the weather now? Any sensible human being would be like, oh, probably she's, st she's standing right behind me right now. Okay, I should probably stop bitching about Karen from accounting, right? You haven't said anything about that, but we know these things, right? That is, a, that is a social aspect of language, right? So language is much more than stringing words together and then acting upon them. There's so many cultural social aspects. If somebody says, I love you, you don't say, yes, I know, or that's correct. You say, I love you too, right? So, but these are expectations. These are social norms. These are, right? Like how do you answer to a, que a factual question? Do you, is it okay to say, I don't know the answer to your question, or do you have to give some answer even if it's incorrect, right? There are some cultures where you have to give an answer. How do you start a conversation? How do you end a conversation, right? All of these things factor into understanding language, and that goes way beyond just knowing the meaning of words and, and sentences and producing words and sentences. So does that answer your question?
How would the model, okay, could this be solved by fine tuning through interaction? How would this model develop an understanding of embarrassment for saying the wrong thing in a public setting, right? If I say something wrong or dumb or stupid or out of context, oh, I'm gonna move a bit away from this or no? Um, oh, it's off? Why do we get the feedback? Am I too close to the, anyway, so how, do, how would the model have the, uh, the knowledge of embarrassment of not saying the right thing, right? How would it know about appropriateness? Like if a child says like, where does the sun go at night? You don't say, oh, let me pull up Isaac Newton's uh, of the movement of celestial bodies, right? That's not what the child wanted to know, right? Probably if you say it goes to sleep and it will come back tomorrow, that's a better answer in that situation. How would you let a machine know these things, right? A lot of these questions are about objective functions and about encoding knowledge but there's so much more to it, right, that we don't have. And as long as a machine doesn't have embarrassment, as long as a machine doesn't have the fear of getting clocked in the face because they insulted somebody, they're not gonna learn these nuances of language, I think, right? One question there, and then another one, and then we'll wrap up here. Yeah. No, you, yes. So, you said that the principle has a trick, yes. So how did, how did it pass the Turing test if it did all of these things wrong? So uh, yeah, like I said this sort of a little bit in a, in a very general manner, right? So these things now can hold conversations that probably would fool most of the judges most of the time into thinking this is a human. But, and this is something that makes me hopeful for the resilience of humans, uh, we have also learned to ask better questions, right? So in the beginning, you were like, ha ha, which city are you from? A computer cannot know this, right? And then these tools started to say, oh, I'm from Dublin and I live here, right? And, you know, it, and then people started to say, oh, actually, but if I keep asking again, which country are you from? And it doesn't say Ireland, right? But it says France, then I know this is a mismatch, right? So then people got wise to that. So then these models learned to get around these questions. So a lot of good models pretended to be children or second language learners to explain inconsistencies or, or flaws, right? Now these models have gotten better, um, but there's still things you can ask to sort of tease that out. And obviously I showed you the, the parts where it breaks down, right? I could fill two hours, five hours, just with examples that look amazing and where everything worked out exactly as you wanted to, right? Um, so, the Turing test is a little bit imprecise, or Loebner price is a little bit imprecise because it says like fool most of the judges most of the time, right? So we've sort of moved the goalposts, um, but I think it's kind of become irrelevant as a test anymore. Can, you can disagree. That's... I can only add that uh, I, I didn't double check, but he didn't use that. Judge GPT passed the bar exam in the United States several times, yeah. which is even more worrisome for us lawyers. Uh, there's one question on your own. Yeah. Yeah, so, so maybe can I, can I rephrase the question as like, are we gonna lose some skills that we have right now if, if ChatGPT is able to do these things and like what should we focus on? So uh, there's, 
there are all of these complaining headlines of like, oh, millennials cannot do simple plumbing tasks in the house anymore that their parents were able to do, right? And somebody just responded and said like, baby boomers are unable to do blacksmithing like the Anglo-Saxons used to do, right? There is some technology knowledge that got lost, yeah? Like nobody here knows how to operate a telegraph anymore. And like, how, who, who knows Morse code? I mean, that it exists, but like, could you write in Morse code? No, probably not, right? Like, previous generations knew these things. Like, yes, you know, I still learned to navigate with a map. And like, it was way more cumbersome. Like, driving with a car with an actual map was horrible and dangerous, right? Google Maps way better. Um, so yeah, some skills will get lost, they will get replaced, but they might become obsolete, right? And people are always like, oh, but what if the internet craps out or you don't have energy anymore, right? And it's like, yeah, of course. And like, what if I have, what if I, I'm in a plane and it crashes in the jungle and I have to build a Robinson Crusoe defense. Like, yes, you can all make up scenarios. Times they are changing, right? Like, my son will have skills that I don't and he will have lost things that I can still do and then I can feel smug and say like, haha, this is how you operate a rotary telephone. Yeah, great, like, how useful is that, right? So some things will change and that's normal and that's probably a good thing, right? Uh, there was a, yeah? So what would it change if we get, so knowledge is embodied and like what if we built machines that in addition to the textual knowledge also had embodied knowledge? Yeah, um, I think that would be the new frontier. There are uh, experiments now with sort of robots that can move around in space and have like a language model to understand commands and know what left actually means in space and right and up and down and and stop, there's a wall, oh, you ran into the wall. Um, and I think if we wanna break through what we have right now and get to a general artificial intelligence, then yeah, that, that would be the next step. That opens up a whole new can of worms because you have two things that are very complicated and not perfect and now you put them together and you make one thing that is even more complicated and like there's great, literature and sociology about normal accidents, the more complicated and like intertwined you make a system, the more likely it is to break down in very interesting ways, right? Where interesting can be life-threatening and horrifying or just like So like, if you Google robots opening doors, it's hilarious, right? So we'll have to push through that barrier if we wanna get somewhere. Um, but it will also just make things a lot more complicated. So I think we're now at a stage where we can talk and think about all of these interesting problems, but I think to solve them, it's way more than just adding one and one, right? Great, I think we need to wrap up. Works, it doesn't work anymore. Yes, it does doesn't work. We need to wrap up now. Um, losing the public and I think we've run out of time. Uh, let's thank once again uh, Professor Bikovi. <laughs> Another question tells about the illuminating conversation we had. Thank you so much and Thanks, everybody. thank you. Bye. Bye everyone. Thanks. <laughs>